Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the uh, second session of the Stein Micro Demo Week. Um, I'm glad to see so many people come to this um, wonderfully techy session we're going to have today. But uh, like I said yesterday, Stein has been known for um, developing hardware platforms and technology for um, creative use, but that sort of changed a lot in the recent years, and one of the main reasons is uh, how ubiquitous it's become and how physical computing or it's becoming embedded in more uh, different fields of education. And also the Arduino is sort of something that's become almost changing the whole landscape of how uh, people develop these systems and how they uh, give access to uh, artists and um, designers. So we're very happy today to have um, two very um, good developers and um, designers of systems. We'll start with Sekandar, who's uh, just been at Stein years ago and also uh, been to cinema now in Berlin, sort of um, built his name as an instrument designer, uh, has held many projects, and he also has his um, system, Julian. Um, so we'll start with this presentation. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, I want to talk a bit about sensor interfaces today. Um, what my take on it is some projects I've done, and yeah, uh, what I've some plans for my own interface, what I'm going to do with it. And um, I brought up this slide here, um, which shows three. Three uh, sensor interfaces, and those are the, you recognize the sensor lab on the left. Up there on the top, that's that's my box uh, called the Kluya, and down there that's an Arduino. And I chose these three because for me that those are sort of my my points of reference reference when it comes to to sensor interfaces. Um, the sensor lab, um, well, because it was First, um, I think it's you can say it's the first sensor interface for musical instruments ever, um, and at least I don't know of any other developments. Um, and that's how I got started, how I got into sensors when I came to Stein in 1992. <coughs> um, And at that time, the sensor lab was really what uh, we were thinking of, a live electronic instrument of sensors. What everyone was thinking of was, yeah, go to Stein, they have the sensor lab. So that was really the defining, defining uh, device, if you were interested in this kind of thing. Um, and today, uh, if you ask people, uh, what do they think? comes to sensor interfaces, most of, most would say, yeah, the Arduino, that's, everyone's talking about it. Um, everyone's using it. Um, yeah, so, so where does that put uh, my my box? Um, uh, the Cluion. The Cluion um, was developed in 2004. I think the Arduino wasn't available then. What was it? Does anyone know? 2002 or 3? Yeah. The first Arduino? Yeah. Really? Okay. In any case, I wasn't really aware of it at that time. Um, um, for me, the challenge was more... I actually tried to think yesterday um, what really prompted the development of the Cluion. And I can't really remember the details. Um, so... I can only do this retrofitly. Uh, like uh, design decisions, like wh why do I use um, an FPGA? And, um, I think you could say that uh, um, that was mostly because at that time I was getting fed up with uh, microcontrollers. Uh, 
this in, in, in the years that I had, had programmed um, devices for various projects. Um, with every project you get a new microcontroller, you get a new big menu, how to, how to deal with its registers, um, what the programming model is, how many bits you have for this, and how many bits for that, how many um, subsystems for PWM, and so on. And yeah, I mean also DSPs and how you. And I was just getting fed up with, with reading all these manuals and, and learning, learning things over and over again. So um, for me, the, the solution was to go the the FPGA way. Um, and I, would, I guess I have to explain that a bit because probably not all of you know what FPGAs are. Um, I don't go into all, to all the gory details, but. Um, FPGA is basically for a field programmable gate array, and what it means is that you define your own microcontroller, basically, or additional, um, any kind of, of logic. It's sometimes called re repro reprogrammable logic. Um, it may sound like that's um, kind, of, kind of stupid idea to, 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 on top of programming a microcontroller, controller also inventing a new microcontroller. Um, but that's not how the Cluon really works. Um, I'm just taking some parts that I need from the microcontrollers, but I skip others. Um, for example, um, let's say you want to uh, control the motor. The standard way of doing this is to use uh, pulse width modulation. So if you use a microcontroller, you have a little subsystem in there, a little block that generates a PWM signal. And there you go. Yeah? The Arduino has, has six channels for those. Um, and that's because of the limitations of the, the microcontroller. Yeah? You're just, you just given six PWM generators, and they have fixed a certain resolution that you can't change. Um, I think I was working at some project where Someone said, hey, I need, I need to control 50 motors. How do I do that? Yeah. And then you think, OK, how do I do that? I can buy um, 10 microcontrollers and just hook them up together and try to synchronize them and make them talk to each other. And I said, hey, that's, that's not the way I want to do this. Um, I want to have the flexibility to, um, to have these 50 PWM generators in one chip. And of course, you can't find a microcontroller that does this. Um, but in an FPGA, you can do that. You define your own PWM. Um, you can have as many as you want, as long as it fits into the chip. You can make them any resolution you want, um, still, as long as it fits into the chip. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a subsystem that you can um, refine precisely. And, um, and you can also combine it with others um, in a mix that, that, you, that you like. Uh, on the other hand, there are certain aspects of microcontrollers um, that you don't really need. Um, for example, the, the, the whole um, arithmetic logic thing, you know, um, computing stuff, multiplying, making decisions, loops, all that, um, I found that I don't really need that. Um, because um, because uh, ultimately, the sensor interface should just uh, collect data from the sensors and then dump that to the main computer and, and let the computer do all the, the, the fancy stuff, um, yeah, the arithmetic logic stuff. Um, that, of course, um, is something that um, is only possible because um, because the transmission speeds and the processing power um, of today's uh, technology have, have changed so much. Back at, in the sensor lab days, you, you had MIDI. Yeah? So you had a limited bandwidth, and you, you just had to pre-process data to some extent uh, inside the sensor lab. So you have to come up with this fancy um, programming schemes having a known 
Uh, uh, Frank mentioned that yesterday. You, you had, it was it was it's running on its own language called Spider, um, and and that's of course how to how to maintain. Um, yeah, and today we, we have fast interfaces like USB. Uh, I use Ethernet. Um, you could also use Firewire or even stream it over a digital audio. So there's really no point anymore to um, to do pre-processing inside the sensor interface, in my opinion. Um, and that also goes along the lines of Frank said about um, uh, about junction. You know, basically junction being the successor of Spider in that you take the, the logic from the sensor interface into the into the main computer. So in a way, um, my interface is really done. Yeah. It's just um, it's just a gateway between between the, the physical world of sensors and, and the computer. Um, okay, where was I? Oh, yeah, feature. The interesting thought is that um, I took some the, some of the design um, decisions for the Cluon are um, go back to the to the uh, sensor lab because the sensor lab um, already had an FPGA. Um, and that's very interesting. For, I mean, for, for such an old device to have such an advanced design, they had a microcontroller and an FPGA, and they used the FPGA to to do all the um, to do specific sensors um, that you couldn't do with a with a um, with a standard uh, microcontroller. For example, you you, um, you could do a very precise ultrasound. And you could connect uh, switch matrices, <coughs> large ones. Those were features that the sensor lab um, <coughs> had, and that many many interfaces that came after the sensor lab they they, they lacked those features. They just had a few analog ins, and and maybe that was one of the reasons I said, hey, I need something that has um, the amount of channels that the sensor lab has. But make it a bit cheaper, make it a bit more modern, and yeah, that's how the, the clear was born. Let's see. Um, those are some bullet points from from my uh, nine p paper about the clear. Um, So why, why, why bother um, with, with, with all these sensor faces around? I mean, there's like 20, 30 other interfaces around, even at the time when I designed the Julian. Um, but um, when I was always um, faced with uh, limitations of the existing sensor faces, uh, one being um, the precision. Uh, I wanted to have an interface that really that runs it at 16 bit to have the most best position possible. Also, also in terms of timing, when you do uh, um, things like ultrasound distance measurement, I wanted to have really precise counters. Um, the PWM I mentioned, I wanted that to be really precise, not just 8-bit as in the Arduino. Um, concurrency is another topic. Uh, on an FPGA, all your subsystems can work um, in parallel, so it's really parallel processing in a way. Um, the PWM doesn't get in the way. Um, when you also want to uh, drive displays, um, gather data from serial sensors, um, have rotary encoders. Um, when you program for a microcontroller, you have to pay a lot of attention to, to, to interrupts and how they get in each other's way. And, and um, if you do a PWM software, 
then you get timing issues, then you get interrupts from other subsystems. So, so the, the Gluon, the Gluon I, I wanted to have um, independent subsystems that can run in parallel. Yeah, fine tuning I mentioned. Um, I can have the PWM run at 12-bit, uh, 16-bit, 15-bit. Uh, and yeah, and portability, that's something um, mm, that still has to be proven. Um, like I mentioned, uh, in the past I've been working on lots of different uh, microcontrollers and um, it was always a bit hard to, to port the, the code, mostly because yeah, you had to learn all, all the register programming and programming models. And, and my hope at least is that with FPGA designs I won't have these issues because um, when you go from one FPGA chip to another it's just it's just gross in, in size, that's the only change. Maybe it gets a bit faster, but that's not really an issue. Um, all this you can read in detail in the paper I did for the 9 in 2006. And I'll move on to um, this slide. Um, that's just... Um, um, what you get for one Kluya, you get uh, talking about money here um, and the business model. You buy one Kluya, you can get 17 Arduinos for that. Um, so that's that's a kind of a, a challenge, of course, uh, because uh, even if I say, yeah, the Kluya has so many outputs and inputs and possibilities. Um, for the money, you, you, you can buy so many Arduinos. Um, um, you, have, you have way more analog inputs this way. And you even have more PWM this way. So um, how can I survive in this situation? And I guess uh, other sensor interface um, manufacturers, they are faced with similar problems because, yeah, the, the Arduino is the cheapest, and it's also open source. It has a strong community. Um, how do you deal with that? Um, and I think, yeah, I thought a lot about um, if I could do something similar, you know, um, also go open source, um, um, rely on, on, on a strong community um, that also uh, covers some of the support, uh, that pushes the further development. But then, of course, the question is, if you go open source, uh, how do you make your money? And I'm hardly the one to really advocate open source now, because um, I'm not doing it. But I think it's an interesting thing to consider. And, and I think it's, it's the, the main reason why the, the Arduino is so successful. Um, because technologically, wise, it's, it's just it's a similar microcontroller that then you can find on a, on a I don't know, a Minitron um, or whatever else is out there. Um, yeah. But then I was thinking, okay, um, what is actually my business? And why uh, don't I have to be afraid? And of course it's that I'm not really, ultimately I'm, I'm not in, in, in the same position here. I, I'm not primarily a sensor interface um, uh, developer. What I really do is, is do projects. Uh, I had a look at what I did this year, um, at the list of things I did, and I realized, realized I didn't sell that many clients this year actually. And um, the ones that I sold, they were all custom, uh, they were custom designs. So let me go over the list of the projects this year, so you can also you can get kind of an idea what what I what I, um, what I did. Um, 
just closed in a short overview. Um, <coughs> first project this year was with Yolanda Harris. I think she's here tonight. Uh, not tonight. Um, <laughs> this morning. Um, Sun Run Sun is a, is a <coughs> sort of GPS um, generated sound project on a small um, a small um, uh, uh, embedded Linux um, platform called the Gunsticks. It runs PD and is a variable variable system. Um, then I did this. This is a simple uh, nail. A sensor that detects a nail being pulled out of, a, of this table and play some animation. Um, not using a glue in here, just a simple um, USB keyboard as the sensor interface. Um, I did this rather um, ambitious project, um, which is a motor fader um, for for the Beast Guys in Birmingham. That is the only Julian Best project I did this year. Really. Um, <coughs> I did this installation in Berlin with Boris Balchum and Boris and Sash Bakaftasarian. Um, this one pulls, it's a little motor that pulls these. Um, Tin cans across uh, a glass surface, so it makes the screeching noises. Um, and does some infrared sensor that detects a, a mark on the string and then reverses direction. Um, this guy reads barcodes and says some comments on them. I did an iPhone project for Edwin van der Heide. Um, again, GPS project where, where um, audio files are tagged with locations, so when you move out on the streets, uh, you, you get a mix of, of the virtual sound sources. Um, and I did this GSR, um, galvanic skin response sensor and heart rate sensor <coughs> for a museum project. It's going to happen next year in Basel. Um, again, no gluons inside. Um, and I did this one, which is called the Red Sea Donkey. Um, that's a funny project where we're using an acoustic camera to look at uh, ultrasound. Um, and the ultrasound is painting a picture here. Um, I won't go too into all the details of, of the projects, but if you're interested, uh, just ask me afterwards. Um, that's a project we started this year, but mostly going to be done next year. Uh, this is again about uh, location, um, navigating through, um, doing sonic navigation. Um, in this case, uh, you remain stationary, but you have this big wheel uh, to move forward. Um, so far, we've done an optical encoder to pick up the movement. And finally, um, this uh, wheel controller, which uh, has two uh, pressure and position sensors at the bottom. So it's like a it's like a modulation wheel taken out of a keyboard and made wireless. And you so you rock it back and forth. You can push down on it and push it left right. Yeah, I mean, that's even uh, Arduino based. So. <laughs> Even for my own sensor instruments, I don't always use the Cluion. Um, those are the Cluions I sold this year. Um, only one is a standard one. Um, the one on the top is a 19 inch track version um, for B Manchester. Then this big box with loudspeaker terminals I made for Lisa Moran in New York. The one on the bottom is uh, for Janis Sanos, um, with check connectors, went to Greece. Um, and then two slight variations of the sneaker model, but with um, more connectors and DMX output.
So that was for this year. Um, I realized, yeah, as I mentioned, um, I, I'm not really trying to, um, to push a product. Um, I'm trying to, what I'm interested in ultimately is to, to do projects, really. Um, and I realized yesterday when I was listening to, to Frank's and David's talks, uh, uh, they're doing um, really different, have a really different approach to uh, in what they, they, they do because they, they have to um, think about, their challenge is to, to, to optimize their tools that will, in a way so they're, um, so they're easier for the user. Yeah, well, at least that's one aspect of it. Of course, they have to be more powerful and have lots of functionality and try to be um, open to the outside so you can get data in and spit it out to all of them. But um, in the end, um, one of the challenges, at least what they talked about, was also to how, how to make it easy for the user to approach their tool. Um, for me, uh, I don't have this challenge, really. Um, the, the people I work with is mostly artists where that have reached the, 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 the boundaries of, of existing tools, and then and then they come to me and ask, hey, uh, I can't do this because that software can't do this, or that, that hardware has this limitation. And then I start to think about, hey, what's what can be done? And um, <coughs> I, really, I really take that challenge and, and make it mine, um, and that's the way I operate. So um, and that's why I don't have to be really of you know Arduino taking over the whole business. Um, okay, what else do I need to talk about? Um, it's another project. Yeah, this one here is a case where um, where the client is used in an embedded way. Uh, so no, not streaming data to the computer, but driving lots of uh, servo motors. That's that um, the, the big um, black blob. That's uh, 128 servo motors. Um, it's the the only robot I built so far is is, is a, a model of an anthill. It's all these servos squirming and making this amorphous mass. Uh, yeah, that, that version of the Cluion points fit into the future plans. Um, this is not driven by uh, OSC via Ethernet. Uh, this takes input from an ADAT light pipe um, because we needed um, <coughs> audio rate audio precision for the for the actuators, in this case uh, pneumatic uh, <coughs> controls, and you needed lots of channels for this. Um, this is for Edwin van der Heide. It was last year, or it was two years ago, I don't remember. Anyway, um, and what was that? That was, um, ah, yeah, that, that was by Robert Carson. He discovered that, that the, the, the switches on this uh, MIDI uh, um, matrix guitar, they were all uh, pressure sensitive. But um, there's so many of them that uh, it's kind of hard to hook that up to analog inputs. So for that, I, I modified the Cluion to multiplex the analog inputs. And <coughs> this has effectively 256 analog outputs. These are some plans for the future uh, with regards to the Cluion. Uh, first one is I, I want a control voltage output. That's mostly because uh, my current neighbors uh, where I work, are, uh, they deal with analog synthesizers. And they get lots of requests for uh, controlling analog synthesizers with um, the CV voltages from a computer. So I think the client should have that. Um, I can sort of do that with PWM, but the resolution is not the best. Uh, I also plan to do more wireless options. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm, I'm just using Wi-Fi modules to, to bridge between the uh, 
Ethernet output and, and Wi-Fi. Uh, but I also want to have more uh, options to have wireless transmission before data enters the FPGA, especially for distributed systems. Yeah, the ADAT, that's going to be one, one option of the Cluion to, to transmit data to the computer. <coughs> um, I might even go for audio <coughs> for integrated designs where you, where you don't want to have too many interfaces. Uh, where you just want uh, one interface for, for audio and sensors. I think you're going to put in the small modules. Yeah, then gain an offset control for the analog inputs. And um, yeah, the modular design I'm not entirely sure about. Uh, that that's something uh, I'm, I'm still considering. Um, uh, yeah. And I think that's it. What I wanted to talk about. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, what are you thinking about using to get uh, good resolution control of the outputs? What if, what if uh, you say one of the things you're interested in doing next is see the output, uh, what kind of hardware? Um, well, not use PWM, but use real DA converters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Do you multiplex the sensor channels on there? Or how, how many? It's only like eight channels of audio, right? So do you multiplex to get more? Channels yeah, I mean it's just it? it's, it's a number of it's 192 bits per frame. I just put my data in. Yeah, there. we could just stuff it in there. Okay. Oh yeah. One bit happens. No, you just you just have these 192 bits per frame. Yeah. And you just put that in. Put in the bytes or whatever. A set, um, um, Put uh, make chunks that just in a, yeah. And for your uh, I, I don't know precisely you know, yeah. for for that pro one project where I used ADA to get data into the clone for the controlling actuators, um, I just used 16 bit samples and use that. But the actuators are, are, are only one bit, like one off. Um, yeah, that's true. What, what but in the end, it's just data. You know, you just stream lots yeah. of bits in your, and and the, the FPGA is flexible enough to, to just um, inter interpret in any way. But do you, as a, as a for for the end users who, who buy a, a, a Gluon, yes. do you have a, um, a a programming model or a tool to reconfigure the FPGA? And how do you program it? Is it over Ethernet, over OEC, or do you have some? Yeah, that's a bit of a problem. I have to admit, with FPGAs. Um, because no, I have used FPGAs uh, uh, many years ago. Yeah. The software is very expensive. It's all variety, and, and I don't know how it is today. But it hadn't yeah. used in like 15 years. But yeah. Uh, but you you get there's all three versions of it that mm -hmm. you can download. Um, but um, of course it's it's a it's a bit of a problem for for uh, users that they see all these flexibility that's theoretically possible people with FPGAs, but they can't really uh, treat that themselves. So at the moment, um, people just um, tell me what they require in terms of um, actuators and input modules. Mm -hmm. And then I uh, compile it for them and set them a configuration. And then they, they upload that over OSC. So basically, you are always uh, involved in the, uh, in the application program. That's true. Yeah. 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 But that's, that's really part of my, my, the way I work. I want to be in, in, in close contact with the artists using my products, and, and, um, and so that for me that's no problem to you know, um, do this for them. Yeah. But it would be a problem if I had like if I would sell thousands of clients. Mm -hmm. I would have support problems definitely, and I would have to think about a different model. Um, but the, the whole um, um, tool chain is quite complex. Yeah. To begin with, you need a Windows system uh, because there's no no um, yeah no software for the Mac to do it. Um, and 
the language that uh, FPGAs are programmed in is, is very large and not many people want to get involved in, into that. So you, you need a higher level, you need to define a pre-processing <coughs> system to, to make it easier. Um, yeah. It's almost like building a full custom hardware. I mean, the complexity and, and the design process. No, not really, because I mean, it, it's I provide modules, yeah. I provide modules like rotary encoders, PWM, um, ultrasound distance measurement, um, switch matrices, LED matrices, a couple more, and then people can choose these modules and combine them. And I do have a build, a, a build system where, where I can just um, put in the, the pin numbers and assign them to, to these modules, and then it gets pre-processed, and, and then yeah, the, uh, the FPGA tooling takes over. And the actual, um, the actual sensor interface, because your board looks like all the headers go directly to the pins of the FPGA, so they don't have true. any level shifting or protection or output amplification or improve that? No. So um, that means that for every part you also have to design this uh, sensor interfacing hardware that requires filters and, and support. Or is that for the end user to do that? Yeah, most are advanced users and they, they, I, I give them hints of course how to do it, but they do it themselves. And one thing I noticed was that the workshops I do, um, there's lots and lots of interest. Um, so the Arduino really has helped to uh, to make uh, sensor instruments more popular again. I mean, there, there was sort of a, um, a phase, um, late 90s, when, when it became possible to make music on laptops, that people were just doing music on laptops and um, just keyboard and track that. And, and only in the, in the early 2000s, um, there was a new, new interest for hardware um, sensors. And yeah, and the art really had a lot to do that. And but I mean, as, as you see from my projects, it's, it's so diverse stuff. Uh, it's, uh, it's not really that I, I, I rely on, um, on sensor instruments. There's very few um, real live electronic instruments that I showed you. It's, it's lots of installation stuff, um, and, and even uh, not even um, um, sound installations. Also, um, more conceptual media art. And so it has shifted a bit. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure. Um, yeah. There's lots more people now interested in this kind of thing, and, and but the people I work for are, um, are mostly not beginners, because that that's taken over by, by being taken care of by, by the Arduino community or similar communities. And yeah, those people come to me later, as you said, when they when they reach the limit with the with the, with the existing. Anymore? Yeah. On which economical basis are you working with the artists? Is it um, based on their um, 
um, situation of commission, or is is it? Um, <coughs> Yeah, they, they get a stipend for their project and they um, assign some percentage of that for okay. the hardware development, for software development. Um, I'm not linked to any institution if you ask me. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough business, of course. Yeah. Um, there's no, no security there, uh, no regular income. Just good years and bad years. Yeah. Do you also initiate pro uh, projects yourself? Like, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a part-time musician, so I also have a few projects. And there's some artists that I work very closely with where where you get at the point where it's hard to define who's doing the artistic work, and I, where I could consider, okay, um, you know, forming an artist group where I'm part of that. And but it's 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 difficult. Yeah, I, I try not to. Um, I really I'm, I'm really more interested in, in, in doing the, the the work rather than you know getting the Recognition as an artist. I think we're going to wrap up the first time. Um, Excuse me? I think we're going to wrap up the first yeah, time. Yeah, okay. Break, but um, thanks, Carmen. <laughs>
So now we start looking at sort of the goals or sort of the strategies for making this all possible. Um, starting with minimizing the cost as well as at the same time maximizing the hardware performance and making it easy to understand. Um, we can also think of this in terms of maximizing the utility. Uh, time is money, so we want to make things quick. Uh, rapid development is really important so that we can um, do all these experiments and find out you know, what's going to be the next interface. Uh, Cross-platform is a good way to achieve some of these things. Um, and USB serial is a tr cross-platform transport, and it also provides power, which kind of helps reduce costs as well. And this is kind of where open sound control starts to fit into the picture. Um, <laughs> it, it makes things easy to understand, which is, I think is important. Um, and I can argue that open sound control helps us maximize the rubber performance, and we'll see exactly how that plays out later. Um, and this USB, USB serial transport is making that possible. Um, so another thing that we should really think about is how to reduce errors, because um, People are learning and experimenting, and mistakes slow that whole process down. Um, one way to reduce errors is to think about semantic modeling, and I'm going to talk about sort of how this plays into micro SC and how we use sort of semantics to describe the circuits and the sensors. Um, uh, semantic modeling is basically accomplished by enumerating all the sort of scenarios that you expect this thing to be in and kind of figuring out what's common and how to describe them. In in a succinct manner. Um, and all that ends up creating these sort of user friendly user friendly interfaces, um, one of which is normalizing the numerical representation of data, uh, for example, using SI units, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, finally, this is sort of the holy grail for the whole project is to eliminate microcontroller programming because it's really horrible. Um, and at the same time, we also want to eliminate all the expensive tools and and other problems that are associated with microcontroller. So that's sort of the big picture view of what's going on. Um, what are those expensive tools? Well, here you got your programmer, debugger, USB protocol analyzer, more protocol analyzers, your commercial tool chain, logic analyzer, and so on. These are all tools that I have on my desk, but you shouldn't have to have them on your desk unless you need them. Um, how hard is microcontroller programming really? Uh, it's actually quite hard. Um, first of all, there's a huge pile of technical terms that you have to learn. It took me about two years to just figure out what's going on and not misinterpret data sheets when I read them. Um, there's all kinds of time-sensitive operations that are where uh, the difference of a few microseconds can make the difference between your thing working and not working. Um, and it's extremely hard to find those errors and debug them. Um, if that's not bad enough, there's actually bugs in the microprocessor itself. Um, and they published dozens of pages of extra information about all the things that have gone wrong in that microprocessor. Um, in addition, it is C programming, but it's quite a bit worse than C programming for a normal operating system because we don't have nice things like protected memory. Um, and in general, there's other very nasty problems with interrupt handle or race conditions where concurrency between uh, different subsystems that are running at the same time create unexpected problems. And in fact, whole people, people, many people have gotten their PhD theses trying to make systems that write provably correct microcontroller code, and it's really hard. Um, so all these are reasons why you should not uh, actually write any code that runs on a microprocessor. Um, so uh, user-friendly interfaces. Um, one of the things that we pioneered with microOSC is that um, we use sort of normalized rep representations of numbers that make more sense. Um, for example, we use IEEE floating point as a representation for analog input values. Um, the nice thing about these is that they're bit depth independent, so I can switch out one micro OSC board with another that has, you know, one of them might have, have a 10-bit A to D, the other one has a 12-bit. It doesn't matter to the end user because they all just show up as numbers scaled from zero to one. Um, so basically, we implement this conversion directly on the microcontroller. Uh, different sorts of ratio metric units, and I'll talk about more about that later, as well as uh, standard SI units, sort of like ohms and you know farads and amperes and stuff like that, um, which are the actual 
scientific units for what's going on in, in a sensor. Um, so here's sort of the idea behind the sort of semantic modeling that goes on in this. Uh, and I'll, I'll show some demos of exactly how this works later. Um, for one, they're easy to understand because if you think about things in terms of the requirements, it's usually a smaller set of items than sort of consequences that result from those requirements. Um, and so that helps with our understanding of what's going on. Um, when we also enumerate all the use cases, then we sort of expose all the useful design patterns and then we have a whole uh, library of sort of instant designs that we can just tap into and say, oh, here's a bunch of different strategies that work, let's just combine them, or what's common to all of these, and, and that's how you find uh, new ones. Uh, you say what's common and what's, what's missing, and then you, that's how you find the new thing. Uh, maximizing the hardware performance is actually really an interesting thing. This is sort of the, the domain of static analysis, um, where once you have some sort of description of what's going on, you know all these properties, and that enables you to optimize the performance of the system um, in a way that uh, wouldn't otherwise be possible. So here's the basic technology stack that we're looking at for micro OSC 1.0. Um, there's a PIC microcontroller. It has a USB transceiver. It implements a serial device class. And on top of that is an open sound control interface. The PIC microcontroller itself has basically these properties, uh, 13 analog inputs, 16 or so, digital I.O., the USB, some very pathetic system resources, and some uh, digital communications capability. This is about the same as like your computer of like 25 or 30 years ago or something like that. Um, and you know, they did run Unix on them and stuff like that, so. Here's some of the actual boards that we <coughs> support currently. Um, it was, this one's kind of a large board with through hole mounting parts. Uh, this one is a CUI made by Dan O'Pro, and he can sell you one if you want it. Um, this is the white one. He has a nice new one that's black. Uh, the SparkFun Bitwhacker is really small, um, and it's so cheap, it's pretty much disposable. We can put it into a product and project and just kind of forget about it. Um, so here's another sort of big picture, the OSI uh, basic reference model. It's a very technical um, sort of description of all the layers that exist sort of in the technology stack um, and shows how this integrates. So at the very top is the application layer, which is where all the interesting stuff happens, um, all your computing and max patching and, and so forth. Um, and everything below that is sort of presentation, which is kind of formatting data, transporting, getting it from one place to another in the hardware. So open sound, the micro OSC sort of spans these three layers, gets you from the hardware up to your application. Um, and interestingly, MIDI is another protocol that also spans all three, uh, which I think maybe attributes to some of its success over the years. Um, So now I'm going to go through a few more diagrams that kind of show how it, how the, these layers play out. Um, so basically, we've got micro OC over here. There's, I break it down into three sort of essential layers. The development layer which is a microprocessor and the code in me, essentially. Uh, systems layer is sort of how it talks to your computer. And the application layer is how you build something interesting on top of this. So essentially, Everything interesting happens down here, and everything really tedious happens up here, and that's where I sit. So I'm trying to convince you that my job's not all that fun. Um, so here's kind of what goes on the system layer. Uh, you've got to get power to your device from the world somehow. You've got to get code in there. You've got to have some kind of network so you can talk to things. And you've got to have some way to identify it. And, and that's actually possible in the USB spec. There's this, this serial identifier, and you can you can set that so that every single one of these micro OC nodes can be uniquely identified, uh, which is a useful thing. Um, in general, sort of OSC requires this sort of uh, schematic diagram. There's basically nodes that talk to each other through some sort of datagram streaming service. There's different varieties of uh, types of implementations of datagram streams, some of them are 
one way, some of them are bi-directional. Um, the USB transport happens to be a bi-directional one, it also has a number of other properties. Um, it's also a serial transport, not a datagram transport, so in order to get datagram on top of that, we use this other thing called SLIP, which is a way of sort of breaking up the packets. So essentially, if you want to implement um, micro OSC support in linear projects, for example, in the junction software, you'll have to implement two things. One is a USB serial interface, which is you can do through sort of standard OS APIs, as well as this SLIP um, decoder encoder that lets you uh, get the packets on and off the serial line. Um, the application layer I'm breaking down into the software and hardware. The software interface is the open sound control bit and the hardware is the circuit. So now a little bit more detail about the open sound control implementation. Um, this is what an OSC message looks like. Um, very simply, uh, there's sort of an address um, and then there's some data. And the data can have a number of different formats including integers, floating point, and strings and so on. Uh, then there's something called an OSC bundle, which packs up a bunch of those messages that we saw before, puts a little hash mark bundle identifier at the beginning, um, and then it has this thing here, which is a timestamp, and that says that all of these messages sort of either happened concurrently with respect to that timestamp, or they need to happen, execute concurrently with that timestamp. So this sort of timing semantics actually turns out to be a very important um, Thing and it, it enables us to do some interesting uh, things with the microcontroller that um, you wouldn't otherwise be able to do just sort of by looking at the messages. Uh, so here's sort of like sort of the basic schema, sort of getting into some of the messages that the device understands and can generate. Things like, you know, what version, what CPU, what what's the platform, how much power do I have? And where is that coming from? Is it the USB bus or is it external? Um, what ID am I? And, and I can like initiate a restart or go to the bootloader. Um, and additional, then I then it goes into the, the messages that sort of describe the OSC implementation itself that's running on the microcontroller, including like the version, what types it accepts and generates, and all sorts of information about the clock. So basically, there's a what I've done on the microcontroller is implement a real-time clock. And um, this sort of situation depicts what fundamentally happens in all sorts of relationships between anything, which is that you've got a protocol and there's some kind of delay in between. Um, that's latency. Uh, and how, how much delay, really? Well, we did some measurements, and um, not only is there some delay of a few milliseconds, um, there's actually a lot of variation in that delay. Uh, and that's the jitter. And jitter is bad. How bad is it? Uh, well, suppose that you have a 10 hertz carrier signal with 10 bits of information and 2 milliseconds of jitter, which is not unusual. Well, the actual headroom of that channel is only 23 dB. So you can see that Here's uh, minus 60, which is the actual sort of maximum headroom for that digital signal. Um, and you've lost more than half your channel capacity just because you have that jitter. Um, so ways to deal with the, uh, well, uh, this slide sort of shows you that um, jitter is uh, it's frequency dependent. So um, as you look at faster rates of sort of gestures or si signals that you're sensing, the amount of jitter becomes more critical on um, the headroom. So I've, I've marked bold wherever the, the total headroom of, this, of the uh, channel is less than 8 bits. And we think that sensor should be at least accurate to 8 bits. So that's kind of uh, the target for us. Um, so basically, there's a clock running on the uh, microcontroller. And you can use this clock synchronization algorithm to set up a, a synchronized time uh, domain between your host computer and the microcontroller. And then you can schedule events to occur at specific moments in the future on the microcontroller, as well as you can you can reconstruct uh, the correct time order of things on the computer. Um, here's that uh, flow control diagram for how that actually works. You get a bundle, 
you look at its timestamp and you say, is that now? If it is, then execute it. Um, if it isn't, then is it in the future? And if it is, then defer it and execute it later. Um, and if it's in the past, then throw it away. It's an error. So basically what happens after you implement that is uh, you've got all this jitter from the transport and we, we recover a constant um, delay. Uh, so, so now we have a delay, but at least it's not um, random, or it's not as random. Um, and, and that whole thing is, uh, I have some papers that just describe, describe how that works, and um, it's very technical, um, and it's also very experimental, but um, this is something that we hope people will become more aware of as an issue with sort of microcontrollers, especially when you look at Arduino and stuff like that, and people have... <coughs> People sort of just throw stuff together and they get the data off as, you know, at some speed and you don't really know what the speed is and you don't really know when those things happened. Um, so it's not a very scientific way of looking at your sensor data. Um, and as you, as you look at more and more complicated sensor interfaces, you'll realize that that sort of thing is actually really important. Um, so how is that actually implemented in the, in the OSC world? Well, you can actually set the time with this message, slash time, slash set, and then you can increment or decrement the clock with these little adjustments while it's running, and then you can adjust its scale factor. Um, and that enables you to, to synchronize the two clocks, on the host and the device. So now into the application layer. This is where the fun stuff starts. Uh, so here's a, here's a little model of how a microcontroller input pin works. Um, it has essentially four states, although usually people say tri-state, which has three states. Um, so the, the three fundamental states are input, output, low, and output high. So when it's output low, it's ground. When it's output high, it's whatever your positive voltage is. When it's in input, it's effectively not connected to anything. It's sort of a floating uh, point in the circuit. Um, but when it's actually an, an analog input, this little gate flips open for a moment. Some charge runs through this uh, resistance and charges up a tiny little capacitor, which is your sample and hold circuit. Um, so how is that represented in the open sound control schema? Uh, basically, we have these things called ports that collect a bunch of pins together. So there's RA, and then there's RA0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, et cetera. Um, and each one of those has a couple of properties. Basically, it's value, which is sort of zero or one, and it's direction, which is input or output. Um, here's a little bit more detail on how the analog input circuit works. You've got some sort of thing connected to it on the outside. That thing has um, some sort of intrinsic resistance, and that's basically its impedance. Okay? Uh, then you have the microcontroller pin, there's another resistance, which is temperature dependent. You can ignore it at room temperature. Um, there's another sort of internal resistance having to do with this little